Today I'll be joined with Rusty Sillyband to give you 10 tips to become a better Roblox scripter. We have 5 tips for code organization which will improve the readability of your scripts, and 5 tips for code optimization which will enhance the efficiency of your scripting process. And with that being said, let's now go straight into the tips for this video. Starting with the first code organization tip, we have some interesting Lua features that you may or may not have heard before, and this was actually taken from one of my active members inside my Discord server, so shout out to him. But essentially, this is broken down into three Lua features in one tip, and the first one I'm going to show you is called template strings. So if we go to our script right here, there's two print statements that basically print the exact same string saying the lucky number is and whatever the value of this number variable is, which is 50. So the lucky number is 50. But both of these are printed in different formats. You may have noticed the first one uses double quotations and it uses the concatenation operator to combine the number with this string literal. Down here, it basically uses a template string to use backticks and it uses hard brackets to surround the variable uh, for its value that we're trying to get all inside of one string, which in my opinion, this looks better when it comes to formatting strings, but it's really up to you in how you want to format your strings. But some people didn't even know this existed. So uh, you can use this if you want to try and format your strings differently than what is normal. The next feature is the underscore operator. And essentially all this does is it makes really large numbers more readable. So it basically acts as commas when we're separating the zeros in a really large number. So we can look at this and say that this is one trillion. But if we were just to look at this number without the underscores, then we would have to count the zeros manually to tell how big this number actually is. And what's interesting about this is if we print this number, it actually prints the number itself without the commas, so it doesn't affect the data type. So you can use this if you want to properly read your very large numbers inside of your scripts. And finally, the third Lua feature is compound operators. So when we're doing mathematical computations with variables, we would basically have the variable on the left side set it equal to whatever the value of the current variable is, and then we um, do the operator and then have the operand or the right operand to calculate it. We, there's actually a simpler way of doing this, and that is by just simply taking the variable and then putting the operator and then an equal sign after that, and then finally the right operand after that which makes this a much more simplified version. So you can do this with subtraction, multiplication, and division as well. And it's just a much simpler way of doing this sort of calculation. So I encourage you to try and use this. And, and these are some Lua features you may or may not have heard of before. The next tip I have for you is comments. Now, before you skip on to the next tip, I just want to heavily emphasize the importance of comments because so many people know that comments exists, but a lot of them don't use comments because they think it's pointless. I'm here to tell you that comments are actually useful and I'm gonna show that through these uh, scripts from this card that I took from the toolbox. So looking at some of these scripts, the guy who made these scripts actually used comments very effectively. And if I were to open up one of their scripts, like let's say the effects script, then we can see that there's comments basically all around the script. And it's important to note any details that some of these things might have that you'll find very useful as a developer, just looking at a script like at its first glance. Because if let's say you're a developer and you're trying to make a free model that is going to be uh, seen by anybody else, they will look at the code and then they will be able to understand it by using these comments to basically uh, take in the information or the extra details and then uh, understand it based on that rather than just interpreting it by looking at the code itself. So it's very helpful to be able to do that, not only for other people who look at your code, but also you yourself as the developer. Because if you were to make something that was complicated, uh, like a complicated calculation or like a function, like let's say, let me go to this chasis module script right here. There should be a function here that is semi complicated just by looking at it first glance, but then there's comments that basically explain what it does. So for the function, it says that it adjusts the torque and springs based on gravity to keep the car drivable. And that's what the function does. But then down here for this specific block of code, it says the speed is adjusted so that the height of jumps is preserved. And also the max speed is scaled proportionally to the square root of gravity. Now, depending on how good you are with these things, you might have been able to guess that just from looking at this. But for other people, it definitely does help them by kind of breaking down what is being shown as code into a more human readable sentence or sentences. So I would definitely say you should use them 
because they are definitely very helpful. Like you can even do them for something as small as functions inside of a function or blocks of code within a function or just blocks of code in general. Like this one just says three words, handle dynamic changes. And that already says enough with what this entire block of code does. And then inside of here, it does even more specification for things that may or may not be understandable at a surface level. So that is my recommendation to you. And I hope this encourages you to use comments more inside of your scripts. The third tip I have for you is using proper naming conventions for your variables, functions, and other things you might have inside of your script. So in the programming world, there's three very famous naming conventions that you should be aware of. Those being camel case, snake case, and Pascal case. So if you were to look at each one of these, the differences among these three are pretty transparent. So for camel case, the first letter of the first word is in lowercase, but then the first letter of every other word after that is in uppercase. For snake case, every single letter is in lowercase, but each word is separated using an underscore to look like a snake. And then finally for Pascal case, this looks very similar to camel case, but the difference here is that the first letter of the first word is also in uppercase, including everything else. Now to describe when these are used, uh, for camel case, these are mainly used for variable and function names, and it's popular among languages like JavaScript, Java, and C Sharp. And for snake case, it's a very, very similar approach where it's also used for variable and function names for languages like Python. And both of them just separate the words easily when we use this naming convention. And then for Pascal case, it's actually a different situation because this is actually used specifically for class names, namespaces, and types. And it's also popular for languages like C Sharp, Java, and Pascal. And these classes and other types are separate from variables and functions. So I would say it's actually very important to use Pascal case uh, in your script and also camel case or snake case inside of your scripts. So my recommendation to you would be to either use camel case plus Pascal case or snake case plus Pascal case. In my opinion, I use the camel case plus Pascal case combo, but it's really up to your preference and standards of what you'd like to do. So that's another tip I have for you. The fourth tip is to use proper indentation and spacing in your code. This is an example of proper indentation. Usually we use four spaces per indentation level as you'll see right here. This if statement is going to have four spaces behind it and this print statement is going to have eight spaces behind it because of the indentation level that it's at. But sometimes this gets messed up as you'll see here. Sometimes the indentation levels simply don't work out all too well and it ends up looking like this. Now I'm going to show you how to fix this automatically. So to fix this, you simply click on this script button right up here. It should be here if you're inside of your script. Then you want to highlight the selected code that you want to format correctly. Then you click on this format selection button right up here and then click on format selection and Roblox is automatically going to format your code for you. Now. That's all that you need to know for proper indentation, but this is proper spacing. Now there's a blank space between the two different code blocks in this function. This is a code block and this is a code block and this is the blank space between them. Now this is because blank lines are used to separate different sections of code, such as between functions, as you'll see right here between these two functions, we have a blank line within a function to separate different logic. As you'll see right here, these two different blocks of code are two different logical pieces or before comments that describe a new section, such as this return values comment and comments like this. So the thing about spacing is that you pretty much just put a blank line wherever you think is necessary in order to make your code nice and readable. Now coming down here, I want to go over inline spacing. Now inline spacing is where there are spaces between numbers and operators inside of the line of code like you see here. And as you can see, it's much more readable than the comparison over here. Moving on to the fifth tip, Use descriptive naming to improve readability. Using a variable named x to indicate player score is a bad idea, as the name x has nothing to do with the player. Instead, give it a descriptive name that has to do with the variable itself. For example, if it's for the player score, name it player score. If it's for tween service, you'll see right here, name it tween service instead of something like ts, especially for services because ts can also get confused with text service or teleport service. The point is that there are multiple different services that share the same initials as tween service, so it's best just to use a full-on descriptive name so that way other people reading your code don't get confused and so that way you don't get confused reading your code as well, thus increasing readability. Now the same goes for functions as well. 
don't just abbreviate words and parameters. It's best to use descriptive names that has to do with the code that the function is executing. For this, this is a function named part touched with the parameter of hit part. It's super easy to read because you know that this function has to do with something about a part being touched and is taking a hit part as a parameter. This, however, the local function of PT and taking the parameter of hit, nobody knows what PT is, and this is just a confusing function in general. So the importance of using descriptive names for variables, functions, and scripts is almost undeniable because the pros are it's easier to read, it's easier to debug in the long run, and it's easier to understand in general. And the cons, well, there are no cons. So that's just another reason that you should use descriptive names. I do find these tips to be very helpful so far, but sometimes when I try learning a new concept, I can't quite grasp it and it's not very understandable, leaving me confused. I totally get what you mean, and I actually do know something that can help you understand concepts effectively in an easy to digest way. And that's actually where our sponsor for today's video comes in, Brilliant. Brilliant is a platform that allows you to learn by doing. With thousands of interactive lessons in computer science, math, data analytics, and AI, the way you learn from Brilliant is surprisingly effective with their approach. Each lesson is filled with hands-on problem solving that lets you play with the concepts. And something important about learning is actually learning through problem solving rather than memorizing. And that's what these interactive courses allow you to do. Learning a little bit every day is also one of the most important things you can do. With fun lessons and even gamification, you can do them whenever and wherever you'd like. Some of the content I think you'll love are their interactive programming courses like Thinking in Code that specializes in thinking like a programmer so you can make really robust programs with features like their drag and drop editor and their syntax free development environments you can learn directly from your browser without the need of other learning tools that's actually really helpful i think i'll try it what do i have to do to sign up to test everything brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days visit brilliant.org slash brawl dev or click the first link in the description you also get 20 percent off an annual premium subscription when you use the link as well Thanks again to Brilliant for the sponsorship, and now back to the video. For the rest of this video, we're going to go over code optimization tips that improves efficiency in your scripts. The first tip that I have for you is collection service. Now, to understand what collection service is, I basically have this kill brick here uh, that has a script. So this script basically kills the player when they touch it by setting their health to zero. Obviously, I wouldn't just have one of these kill bricks. So if I were to duplicate this and then move it this way, and then if I were to take these two kill bricks, duplicate it, and then move it this way, and then do it one more time like this, um, we can see how unorganized this gets very quickly, as now we have all of these kill scripts that do the exact same thing, but it's all separated with their own scripts, and it's just very disorganized. Like, if I were to make a change to one of these uh, scripts, then it's not going to reflect on these other scripts, and it's going to be a nightmare to manage. This is where collection service comes in, where we essentially add a tag to the parts that we want to change, and then we use a script to get all of the parts that are associated with that tag and then create functionality through that one script. So if I were to get rid of these um, kill bricks and just leave one of them and I disable this one, uh, in order to add a tag, I'm gonna go to view and then go to the tag editor. And then if I select the part, then as we can see, there's already a tag here called kill brick and this is already associated with it. So now if I were to go to my collection service script right here, uh, we're calling collection service and we're going to get a table of kill brick parts that have this kill brick tag. So then we're going to loop through each part that's inside of this kill bricks table. And then we're going to make a death on touch event. So basically the same thing that we just had for this script, but instead it's for every single part using collection service to get a table of all of these parts to do the same thing inside of one script. So this is a very good optimization strategy to use. And if you want to learn more about this, I have a dedicated tutorial video on collection service, which I'll have a link for you on the top right here if, you, if you're interested. But this is something very useful to have inside of your Roblox game. The seventh tip I have for you is using module scripts. Now, basically what a module script is, it's a shared script that returns a table full of information that you can use inside of your other scripts. So what I mean is, 
Um, this module, this is the name of the module script right here, and this is a table. Now, we return this table if we have a script that calls this module script, and we can use whatever is contained inside of this module inside of our own script. So what's going on over here is we have a function that's being created called print message that is a, uh, that is a function that belongs to our module. And then this one does the exact same thing as well. This is another function that belongs to this module table. Basically, these are all different ways you can create functions. So this is one way of creating a function, and this is another way of creating a function. And this is also another way of creating a function by putting it directly inside of the module table, um, having it be separated by commas or semicolons. And then you could have other bits of information other than functions. You could even have things like Booleans or numbers or really anything you want inside of your module script. Once we have all this information, we return the module table and then we can now execute it inside of a different script. So this is a script inside of server script service that basically uses the require keyword to locate the module script and then give us the table that we want so that we can use it inside of our script. So then once we do that, we can basically use uh, all of the properties inside of the module table that has been returned back to us, like print message, print second message, print third message, that are all functions that we can activate inside of this script. And then we can also get other properties like the game running um, property inside of our module table uh, to also print true, because that's what uh, the game running property inside of the module script does. If you want a more in-depth tutorial on that, then I suggest watching my in-depth tutorial on it as well. Um, but this is definitely something you should also add inside of your scripts because this can give you a lot of code reusability that will help you optimize your code a lot. Tip number eight, avoid using the parent argument inside of instance.new. The parent argument in the instance.new function is where you simply assign the parent of the instance you just created inside of the instance.new function just like this. This becomes a problem due to something called server replication. The client renders everything going on inside the game, okay? And the server replicates everything to the client so it can render it all. This means that if we make changes to the part while it's in the game, the server needs to replicate that change to the client. So you'll see that the server has to replicate to the client each change that we make. As you see here, we create the part, the server replicates that the part was created to the client, the part's name gets changed as we see right up here, the server has to replicate that to the client, and so on and so forth for every single property that we change after the part has already been added to the game. So you'll see that the server has to replicate to the client for every single part. However, it'd be much faster if we assign the parent of the instance last, so that way the server doesn't have to replicate to the client until the very end. This is because the instance is not yet part of our game, it's simply floating around in some memory block until we assign the parent. And as you'll notice, this is much more optimized because we create the part, we change the name and all these other properties, and then we add it to the game right here when the part's parent changes, and that's when the server replicates all those changes to the client. So it is much more optimized to put the parent at the end here instead of using the parent argument inside of the instance.new function. And moving on to the ninth tip, use the developer console to maximize optimization. Click on the Roblox menu, which is this button right up here, or you can simply press the escape key. Then you're gonna go over and click on settings and then scroll all the way down to the developer console and you're gonna wanna click on open. Now, when you open this, it's going to display the output right here. And you'll also notice that it will tell you the errors of your code, warnings, and other information like that. Now, if you want to, you can also change from the client to the server at any time. And while you're on the server, you can run commands that will fire at any time and real time in your game. But the main thing I want to show you is the micro profiler. So in order to get to the micro profiler, we have to click on this drop down menu over here in the top left and go down to the micro profiler tool. From there, you can turn it on by clicking on the client button and you'll notice this bar right up here. Now, each of these individual lines is a unique frame of your game. The taller the orange line, the longer it takes that frame to render. Now hovering over a line, as you see I'm doing right here, will display all the details of that frame being rendered such as the CPU and GPU usage, the time it takes to render, and even more. You can also feel free to pause the micro profiler at any time to take a look at any specific keyframe or frame I should say by pressing this pause button right up here and this will allow you to look at any specific frame. 
Now that's about all that you need to know about the micro profiler in order to start using it. You can use this for researching how you can optimize certain features of your game to take less time to render the individual frames which will lead to further efficiency. Tip number 10, use errors, warnings, and printing to help debug your game. Here I have a simple data store script set up to give you an idea of where you'd use these different functions inside of a script. Now right here, if the data is saved, so if it was a success, then we simply print out a message to indicate that it was successful, saying print data has been saved. Printing is for general use and for debugging purposes. That's about all that printing is used for. However, if the success was not successful, whereas the data was not saved, then we're going to error and we're going to give the error that this pcall gave, which if you don't know what pcalls are, Brawl Dev has an amazing tutorial that you can watch. But errors are for when something goes critically wrong with your script. These should halt execution and alert you immediately to the problem. This is pretty much creating your very own error inside of your output that will pretty much just alert you as to what went wrong, why it went wrong, and when and where it went wrong. If you scroll down here to this load data function that I have, once again I have this print statement that if it was excess that the data was loaded, I also have an alternative warn. Now a warn is for potential issues that don't necessarily need to stop your script and they're for more minor issues. Now a saving data error is not as significant because the player has already been pretty much removed from the game at that point. It's a lot harder to deal with than a loading data error because most of the time you already have the data saved. It was just a problem with actually loading and you can kick the player or make them rejoin and the issue is pretty much fixed from there. So using a warn here in my opinion would be a much better choice than an error, but you can use them interchangeably. So using these three in conjunction is bound to help you with your own debugging, which will lead to more efficient scripting and increased optimization. And that's going to be it for this video, where we discussed about 10 tips to become a better Roblox scripter. Be sure to check out Rusty Silly Band with his channel and his tutorials, since in my opinion, he does make really great tutorials that I think you would find to be helpful as well. I will also leave a link to my module scripts tutorial that you might also find to be extremely helpful as that goes more in depth into how you can implement that inside of Roblox Studio. So with that being said, that's going to be it for this video and I will see you in the next one. Take uh, care.